she can just faff off. <laughs> fork, fork For, off, fork off. Fork off. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Doc Talk, where we discuss current events and what this may mean for you. From research and studies to pop culture and everything in between, we want to break it down for you. With that, let's get started. So. May is Mental Health Awareness Month, Mm -hmm. and we'd like to discuss an area that we don't often touch on that I think is emotionally taxing and requires a lot of waiting. The two-week wait, or Uh. TWW. (laughs) Dr. Choi, if you could give us a quick synopsis of what the two-week wait is. So the two-week wait, as you and I both know, it feels like eons, even though it's only about anywhere between 9 to 14 days after your embryo transfer, if you're doing IVF or a frozen embryo transfer, or after your IUI, intrauterine insemination. And it's that really crucial waiting time when your body's trying to figure out, am I pregnant or am I not? And obviously it feels like eons. Um, and while it is two weeks for many, like you said, the mm-hmm. short period of time can feel never ending, anxiety inducing. I think it's when you feel really out of control and really isolated. Um, during this time, you may be tempted to look for signs of pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Choi, we have a Healthline article that shares um, signs your embryo transfer may have been successful. Um, what do you think the legitimacy of these signs are? Um, for whether or not a person is pregnant. So I'm gonna give you a list of symptoms that some people attribute to pregnancy, and I need you to tell me yes or no, that's a symptom of pregnancy. All right, you ready? Let's go. This is gonna be fun. Okay, spotting. Uh, Maybe a sign of pregnancy or early implantation of an embryo, but it could also just be a harbinger of your upcoming period. So it's, you know, it's, it's either or, sorry to say. I think we're gonna find that with many of these. Yeah, that's probably gonna be the blanket statement, but let's go through Let's go them. through them. Yeah. Cramping, if I have cramps during my two week wait. So again, cramping, especially just to like, as a reminder, after you have anything put into your uterus, meaning like an IUI catheter or an embryo transfer catheter, your uterus, cause it's a big old muscle, responds by tensing up and relaxing, so cramping up. So muscle cramping of the uterus is not uncommon for a lot of individuals after they undergo an IUI procedure or embryo transfer, even for a couple of days afterwards. So long as there's no fever, not a big deal. And then later on, as you're waiting in that nine to 14 day period, um, some people will call and say, hey, it's about a week after my procedure, you know, I'm having more new cramping, does this mean I could be pregnant? And the answer is, is just like for the first one, maybe, but it also could just be the sign of your period starting up. Right? Makes sense. Um, I think you'll say something similar for sore breast and tiredness. Yep. People report those. So here's the other thing, right? Sore breasts happens a lot in your luteal phase, L-U-T-E-A-L phase, when your progesterone levels are going up. So progesterone is a hormone that's circulating through your body. If you've you know, ovulated with a little bit of assistance from your own ovaries, your body's making all this progesterone, and so that can cause a myriad of symptoms, including breast tenderness, nipple soreness, fatigue, grumpiness, super cranky, some people get. Um, And, you know, unfortunately, although it can also be associated with early, early signs of pregnancy, it could just be normal. These all could be normal signs of your luteal phase. So it's really hard to tease out. And that's like the maddening part for those of you who are just kind of waiting to see, I want to get pregnant. Is this happening or not? I'm sure none of you get cranky. I'm sure you're perfectly delightful. No, I'm always cranky, right? (laughs) Um, What about nausea? It's often associated with early pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Is that a good sign? Um, It's a neutral sign. So some people will say, so again, all of these symptoms, including nausea, can happen for some people even during the luteal phase, especially if you're taking supplemental hormones from your doctor because they're giving you estrogen patches and progesterone injections and progesterone suppositories, depending on what they think is appropriate for your treatment and your support. And all of these exogenous hormones can cause nausea. Um, Nausea after you've been diagnosed with a pregnancy. So after the two week wait, hooray, you have a positive blood test and your doctor or nurse calls you up with the great news. Some people will say they feel nausea. Um, Other people will call freaking out because they're like, everybody else has nausea. I don't, but I'm pregnant. This is a bad sign. And the answer is no, it's not a bad sign. Each person will experience pregnancy also differently. I love that. Bloating um, and discharge. What do you think about those two symptoms? Again, same answer. Bloating can be like, you know, you ate too much garlic or avocados (laughs) last night. Or, you know, again, could be a sign of just, you know, normal luteal phase signs or an impending pregnancy. It can mean a whole mix of things and the vaginal discharge. 
again, if you're using a lot of exogenous hormones, so supplemental hormones that your doctor is prescribing you, a lot of people will complain of more vaginal discharge, lots of white clumpy stuff, all associated with the medications. Also could be a sign of pregnancy, but the tricky thing is it could be a whole mix of things. And I think the last and probably most likely one, um, missed period. Well, missed period, that could be a good sign, especially if you're used to very regular cycles and you know that you went into the doctor's <laughs> office and did an insemination <laughs> or um, that you had an embryo transfer or that you got triggered with Ovidril, for instance, and had heterosexual intercourse at home and you're used to having 28 to 35 day cycles and two weeks after that procedure or ovulation, you still haven't gotten a period, that could actually be a, a hopeful, positive sign that you're pregnant. But understand that sometimes a period can be delayed, especially again, if you're on supplemental medications and hormones. So it's super important to comply. And I think in this case, most people are like, why wouldn't I comply to go to your doctor's office, do that crucial blood test when they tell you to. I see a lot of people on Chatter Online and, and patients I talk to talk about testing at home early. Yeah. Um, and so they have an appointment at their clinic. They're going, let's say, Monday morning, which is maybe day nine for that blood test, yeah. which is usually how they confirm pregnancy. Um, what What are your thoughts about testing early at home? So uh, I don't blame you, right? <laughs> You've been working to this goal for who knows, like years, months, and you're dying to know. So even though your doctors will tell you, don't test, I'm gonna go over the reasons why we say that. I get it, if someone says, hey, listen, I, I you know, they're kind of abashed and they say, I, I kind of cheated at home and tested at home, and it's not like you're gonna get arrested. <laughs> the reason why we ask you not to test though, is sometimes is, is those urine pregnancy tests, even the most like fancy ones, um, aren't as sensitive as the blood test. So invariably I have some patients dragging in on their appointed day for their blood test and they're totally bummed out. And when I ask them why, they'll say, I tested multiple times and everything was negative. And I'm like, you know, that could be an indication. However, the blood test may show you something different. So let's wait for a few more hours for your blood test to come back. The blood test is a lot more sensitive. So as you know, yes. Professor Alyssa, <laughs> um, after because we work together, um, and she's taught me a lot also. As you know, the, the blood test, a positive pregnancy hormone level in your blood, depending on which lab assay you're using, is usually anything above 5 MIU per ml of beta HCG hormone in your bloodstream. And the pregnancy tests that you pee on, right, when you pee on a stick, are usually only as sensitive. They can only detect to a lower level of anywhere between like 20 to 25 or 30 units. And that's the reason why we always tell patients, especially when we bring you in early for these pregnancy tests, sometimes those home tests don't always work. However, if you happen to like know you're going in in the next day or two, and you're like, I can't wait, I just need to just check. And if your test is positive, that's a pretty good indication that you're pregnant. And we still want you to go into the doctor's office because we need to be able to, as you know, Alyssa, like follow the trend and the mm -hmm. rising hormone levels that are associated with a normal, healthy, ongoing pregnancy. And whatever you do, if you do test at home, mm -hmm. don't stop your medications if it's negative. Oh my goodness, yes. absolutely not. Yes. I can't tell you. <laughs> How many times has this happened despite the fact that we've given instructions and I get it, it's overwhelming, you're feeling pretty emotional, you're kind of stressed out, you're trying to know, like figure out am I pregnant or not. If you're negative because you test at home, do not stop. Yes. I've had a number of patients over the years where they, they've said to me, I stopped my estrogen patches or I stopped my progesterone suppositories mm -hmm. um, two days ago because I tested at home and it was negative. I'm just coming in because you told me to. And lo and behold, they have a positive pregnancy blood test. Um, you need that crucial, if your doctor prescribed it to you, crucial exogenous hormonal support to keep that pregnancy going. Yeah. Regardless of whether you test at home or not, go to your go to the blood test. Please. Go see your doctor and continue Please. to follow their instructions. Yes. One little caveat for that last commentary, by the way. Let's say, for whatever reason, you forgot what Lissa just said, <laughs> and uh, you tested a day or two before you were supposed to go and do the blood test, and you're negative, and you stopped doing your meds because you were so upset and you went out for a drink. And then your doctor calls you up and says, oh, actually your blood test is positive. They'll tell you to start up the hormone therapy. You haven't done anything terrible. And having that drink, I mean, not that we encourage you to drink while you're pregnant. Um, and we ask individuals, right? We mm -hmm. ask everybody to treat yourself as though you might be pregnant after your IUI, mm -hmm. after your embryo transfer. So no alcohol, no hot tubbing, no other like things you'd want to avoid during pregnancy. But if you end, ended up having a drink, don't despair. Talk to your doctor about it. It's not the end of the world. You'll likely be okay. 
good advice. Yeah. yeah. So, Lisa Klein. Yes. It's yes. my turn to ask you a question. <laughs> and I don't know if you realize she is a font of wisdom, not just because she's Lisa, <laughs> but she is also a licensed clinical social worker and she's worked with a ton of fertility family building patients over the years. So, it's not like I'm just asking someone off the street. <laughs> um, during this really important waiting time, mm -hmm. um, when a person's told, don't test, don't do this, don't do that, what are some ways that you would recommend to help someone's mental health um, to get through this waiting time without focusing on what symptoms they might be feeling or not feeling? How do you like have them sort of stay healthy during this, this waiting time? Yeah, good question. I would say I'll answer this question in, in a similar way than I would be at any sort of anxiety-inducing time, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're waiting for a pregnancy test or waiting for a different kind of result or whatever that is, right? Yep. That weight is always really frustrating. I think it's when you feel most out of control and that increases stress. Um, so I would say focus on yourself. Um, do the things that bring you joy as long as they are safe for pregnancy. Um, make sure that you are taking some self-care, we call it a lot. And so examples, um, take a walk with your friends or your support network. Um, Even though you might not feel like it, invariably you're going to feel great once you sort of like drag yourself off the yeah, sofa, true. like call your friend, yep, go out. Yep. Yeah. No heavy working out usually yep. is the recommendation, but nice gentle movement is always good. Um, take yourself to your favorite meal. Often when we talk about self-care, we mention things that cost money and there are a lot of free self-care things too, like walks. But if you have the means, uh, a meal or a treat, something that you like to do, um, spend time doing things that make you happy. So um, for some people, maybe reading a book or watching Netflix. I think there always Bridgerton's is something to... <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so some self-care, take care of yourself, I think is number one. Um, find things that distract you. Work is a distraction if you work outside of your home or inside of your home if you work remotely. Um, but that's not the only distraction. Learn a new hobby. A friend of mine just took up cross stitching, um, oh, which cool. is fun, right? Is that like needle pointing? I think it's similar. It's kicking it old school. I'm right. not exactly sure. It's needles and thread and like That's very things. retro, actually. Very retro, right? yeah. Jane Austen-ish. So <laughs> go ahead. Um, find a new recipe. Mm -hmm. I like that one. Like learn to cook. And a lot of these things are things you could include your partner in if you have a partner mm -hmm. or other people in your support network. I think it's really important at this time as a lot of parts of your journey to lean on your support. Um, and so if you have a partner that's um, spending time with your partner if that is not stressful for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you have friends, you don't even necessarily need to disclose to them that you're undergoing treatment that may be sensitive, that may be not be something you're comfortable with. I fully understand that. You can say like, hey, I'm, I'm free on Saturday afternoon. Can we go for a walk, right? Um, and so lean on your support network. I think that's really important. Um, I think we talk a lot about things you can do, but I think it's also important to talk about things that you may not want to do. Um, and so during this oh, time, throughout your journey, but especially in this time period, maybe removing yourself from some social situations that could either bring you stress or be triggering in some way. And some examples might be baby showers or children's birthday parties, things like that. Um, might be things that may be a little too triggering during this time. Yeah, like the family gathering with Aunt Gertrude who keeps on asking you exactly. when you're going to have kids. Exactly. You know. Tell Gertie to mind her business yes. and you can remove yourself from that type of... Um... She can just faff off. <laughs> fork. Fork off. Fork off. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I think what is probably the most important thing and what I think is really proven to reduce stress is some form of mindfulness. Um, there are great apps that are available, many of which have free versions. Um, mindfulness, like uh, meditation and things like that, um, really do help relieve stress and help center you and ground you um, and bring peace of mind. And so I think all of those are good things to do during the two-week wait. Did you used to recommend anything else to your patients when you were seeing patients? Um. No, I think, like, I mean, all of those recommendations, they're great. Yeah. And I like the idea of the cross-stitching. I'm going to have to look <laughs> into that. Um, 
Oh, sometimes like let's say, oh, knitting too? Yeah. Or are you talking yeah, about yeah, crocheting? Yeah. That was like mm-hmm. a little teeny tiny set of knitting needles. I don't think you knit, neither <laughs> I do, do I. <laughs> um, and then I also think it's really important, like sometimes people will ask, is it okay for me to get a massage? Because I, I love to get them to relax or someone just gifted me a, you know, a spa day. And the answer is totally fine to get a massage done, right? Um, so long as you haven't had, for instance, like a recent retrieval and you feel super bloated and your ovaries just feel like, you know, two boulders, in which case you may not even want to sit and not rely on a <laughs> massage table. But otherwise, there's no harm in doing a massage. People are always worried that it's going to hurt the embryo. No, you're okay. Yep, agreed. Yeah. Follow instructions that your doctor gave you. So for some people, like intimacy with their partner might be not allowed during this time, but talk mm-hmm. to your doctor about what's allowed Good point. for you. Yes. Um, we talked about testing. Uh, we talked about things that you can focus on. Anything else you would recommend for, for folks during this two-week wait um, to bring peace of mind and, and sort of distraction? No, I think it's really important, though, to sort of realize that um, as badly as you want this to happen, one, your doctor and your nurse team and the all whole team at the Fertility Center, they're all on your side. They're all rooting for you. Mm-hmm. Um, Although you might feel very alone, um, just understand you have a whole crew backing you. And regardless of the outcome, it doesn't change your self-worth or value. I think a lot of people feel like that, you know, if it's basically go for broke, if if this doesn't work, if I'm not pregnant, that's it. I just, it's, uh, I'm worthless. And Mm -hmm. I think it's important that you also, I'm sure you have some tips in terms of how to address that. Yeah. Yeah, I think think of think of sort of reframing the positive of all of the work that you've done and all of the goals that you've achieved towards this step. And this is a part of the journey, but it's not the end or even the beginning of a journey, right? It's, it's just a continuation. And so while this seems easy from two people sitting having some coffee to say, try not to put that much water, <laughs> non-alcoholic, right? <laughs> Try not to put that much pressure on this single point in time right. um, because it really is, we say journey and, and I don't know of a better word, but it really is a continuum and, and not only about this one event. Absolutely. And it, and it doesn't define you. Yeah. Right? So I think that, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and while two weeks feels like forever, there's a, an end to it mm-hmm. and then and then good next steps after that. And yeah. so talk to your doctor. If you have access to the progeny benefit, that includes your progeny patient care advocate. You can speak to your patient care advocate at any point. Yeah. And during this time, they can also help you with tips and tricks. Um, and you can, through your patient care advocate, reach other experts at progeny, nurses, embryologists, et cetera, if you have questions. That's a great, great um, yeah. observation. So yeah. include progeny in your crew and your family if you have access to progeny. And if you don't or if you do and are looking for extra support, I'm a little biased as a licensed clinical social worker, but um, find a therapist or someone you can speak to. Usually you have some sort of access of coverage through your employer, often for behavioral health support, and that's always important. I like to normalize it and say so many people find that to be really helpful through their journey. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, really important. And that's you don't have we, to go through this alone. Yeah, exactly. You're not right. alone. And it, whether you have progeny or not, you're not alone. But when you do have progeny, you're especially um, surrounded by folks who really care. Yeah. And that's all we have time for today. Yeah. Which right. this was so much fun. I know. We should we should do this again. We should do right? this more often. Yeah. Maybe soon. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, thank you so much for watching. We hope this was helpful. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. Um, and let us know other topics that you think would be interesting for us to talk to the doctor Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Thank you.